distinguished experts, uh, faculties, students. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, attending our webinar. I'm Wendy from School of Information Management of Wuhan University. I'm so delighted to be the moderator of today's webinar. And today's webinar's topic is metadata development in China, multi-field application and its implementation approaches. It's organized by the School of Information Management of Wuhan University, Publicity Department of Wuhan University, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, DCMI, and Library Society of China. The School of Information Management of Wuhan University uh, is also co-sponsoring um, this event. So first of all, let's give the floor to Professor of School of Information Management of Wuhan University, Ms. Huang Ruhua, to introduce the background of the conference. Distinguished experts, colleagues, faculties, students, good morning. Um, we're in our weekend, but we do have lots of participants attending a webinar, more than 100 participants. Thank you so much for joining our webinar out of your busy schedule. So first of all, I want to report to you um, the purpose of today's webinar. Over the past several years, with China's further reform and uh, opening up as well as is accelerated and pays, we need to do two very important things. First of all, we need to bring in new things. We need to introduce new practices from overseas countries back into the Chinese market, but also internationally, uh, they need to understand China better. The library resources management and library management um, should be further promoted to our international colleagues. And over the past several years in our international exchanges, we have been attending lots of international uh, seminars, uh, including um, the annual conference of ICONCUS, as well as uh, the biggest event of the Library Society. And also we have attended lots of digital con um, conferences uh, on building digital library. So we believe when more Chinese experts introduce our experience to our colleagues, we're able to bring better sense of cooperation and better academic exchanges. This is beneficial to both of us. So this has enlightened me. Why do we introduce some Chinese practices to our colleagues in overseas countries? And uh, we are sponsored and supported by the publicity department of Wuhan University, uh, in which it has initiative to train and nurture uh, students to solve problems in social and economic development of China. Some people may think metadata is pretty technical. In fact, metadata is an important scientific topic. Maybe some of you are not aware of it, that uh, in Nature, it released an article in June this year. The title of the article is about metadata. And uh, more specifically, it's about information sharing in relation to the current COVID-19, and it has lots of things to do with uh, metadata. So metadata is not only an issue in relation to information sharing in library services, but also metadata uh, can build a foundation for information sharing in multiple fields. And now with the further opening of data in education, in science and technology, in government, as well as in business, we believe metadata will play an even more important role because it can add more services and value to every one of us. So for all everything to happen, metadata is an important component because metadata is the data about data. If metadata is right, we can get everything right. And last year, the Dublin um, Core Metadata Initiative hosted an important meeting as well. So for the sake of today's participants, we uh, have lots of lay people joining our webinar as well. So I think first of all, I need to give you an introduction to DCMI. DCMI um, is for Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Last year, um, DCMI hosted an annual conference in 
um, show, we had several Chinese colleagues introducing our practices on metadata as well as the development of metadata in China uh, on the Annie conference. So for lots of international colleagues, they do show lots of interest in metadata development in China. And uh, that's why last year I joined the DCMI Education Committee. And that's why I wish to take the, the opportunity to make further contribution. And that's why starting from the end of last year, I said we need to do something. So together with several colleagues of DCMI Education um, Committee, I say, why don't we host a webinar to introduce some of the practices in metadata development in China to our overseas colleagues? And they, they said, sure, but why don't you give us a proposal? I said, not a problem, I can give you a proposal. And I wish to more specifically talk about metadata development in China, as well as in multiple fields, not just in library, but also in other fields. I submitted the proposal to the Education Committee. They said, this is a nice idea. And uh, I received approval from them. And then I went to access different experts. And that's why we have our lovely experts for today's webinar. And later on, Ms. Wangzi will introduce our several experts. Now we have the topic. Now we have um, our experts to let more people participate in our webinar to access more audiences. We have the virtual uh, conference today. We speak in Mandarin because this is going to be a um, webinar in Mandarin, but we wish to show our confidence as well as our best practices to overseas countries. So that's why for today's event, all keynote speeches are going to be delivered in Chinese. But for the sake of our overseas colleagues, we are going to um, present you with simultaneous interpreting. And Akado from Beijing will provide full simultaneous interpreting in English for every one of us coming from overseas countries. But also at the same time, DCMI uh, said our event is a lovely event, is a meaningful event. So it wished to put our event as one of the series of DCMI Education Committee's um, channel. So all the video recording will be uploaded to the DCMI Education Committee YouTube channel after the meeting. So for today's event, um, it's going to be very meaningful and it's going to last for longer period of time. And these are some of the purposes of why we host today's webinar. And uh, we have received lots of support from um, Mr. Deng Ling. Um, Deng gave us lots of support, gave us lots of good ideas. And also Deng helped us promote our webinar as well. And also Professor uh, Jin Chao um, is the acting chairman uh, of a DCMI acting committee. Um, the professor gave us lots of support and, uh, and practices as well. So for all our experts, uh, once again, I wish to say a big thank you to every one of you. I know you're pretty busy, but uh, you fully support us. And also we had Lei Ting Wang Di, Huang Yu Ting and Jiang Jun here. These are all our conference team members. We've done uh, lots of preparation work. And um, Ms. Zhang from the interpreting team also uh, gave us lots of support. Well, in fact, this is the first time we do simultaneous interpreting for this event. And that's why for all our experts, we've done uh, all our presentations in um, bilingual languages and we've done lots of rehearsals. Uh, yesterday in relation to simultaneous interpreting as well. So these are some of the arrangements of our today's agenda. Okay, this is the end of my part. Now, uh, Ms. Wang Di, now the floor is yours. You can start moderating. Thank you very much, Ms. Huang. Thank you so much for your introduction, your lovely introduction. And thank you so much for all the hard work um, you've put into organizing the webinar. So now, please allow me to give you a brief introduction to some of the experts here for today's webinar. We have invited five experts in metadata in China, and they are going to deliver keynote speeches one after another. So first of all, we have National Library Research member, Ms. Xia Lei, and her topic 
is application of metadata in the construction of government information resources in Chinese libraries. And the second speaker is researcher of Shanghai Library, member of the Digital Humanities Committee of the Chinese Society of Social Sciences Information, Ms. Xiaotui Juan. And her topic is from heterogeneous metadata solution to integrated ontology design, the utility of application profile. Our next speaker is Mr. Wang Zhi Chiang. He is the deputy director of High Tech Standardization Institute of China National Institute of Standardization, deputy secretary general of the National Technology Platform Standardization Technical Committee. And his topic is application of metadata standards in science and technology resource management. And the fourth speaker for today's event is uh, Ms. Huang Ruhua, Deputy Director of Academic Research Committee of China Society of Library, Professor of School of Information Management at Wuhan University, and also member of DCMI Education Committee. And her topic is Using Metadata in Organizing Education Resources in China. And our last speaker, but not the least speaker, is um, An Lu, Professor of School of Information Management of Wuhan University, Director of Int International Society of Knowledge Organization. And she's going to talk about information organization in social media in public emergency situations. A warm applause to all our lovely experts. And please turn on your camera and uh, I will stop PPT sharing for a moment. And uh, Miss Lisa, uh, Miss Sally, um, first of all, we're going to do a group picture. Miss Lay, are you there? Uh, I can see everyone's screens here. Oh, I haven't stopped um, PPT sharing, right? Yeah, just bear with me. Miss Lay, you can do some adjustments. You can adjust your screen function. You can adjust the screen size or the size of the screen. Um, so make them um, an equal of nine. So you will be able to see all our experts. Not a problem. I'm going to do a screenshot and then I'm going to formulate a group picture for every one of you. Thank you very much. So you can just do the screenshot. You are pretty experienced. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, I've already done it. All right, so when I come down this three, two, one, please look at the camera. All right, so we have snapped it. Thank you for your cooperation. And uh, let's uh, jump right into our speeches. And the first one is Ms. Sally. Can you share your screen? Okay. Bear with me at the moment. All right, thank you for your information and introduction.
First, I'd like to thank for the organizers for this rare opportunity, and I'd like to share about the application of metadata in the development of government information resources in Chinese libraries and some of my own opinions. In recent years, besides those, uh, the paper publishing, and also we have carried out the construction and the building of the information integration, like the collection, integration, and the service for the information and for the web archive for the government affairs and open data of the government affairs. So in this is three applications, I'd like to have a brief introduction. In China, about the information integration started from 2008. The State Council promulgated the regulations on the disclosure of government information and had incorporated libraries into the government information disclosure system. So the National Library has launched this special project first. And in 2011, it has become a project of the Digital Library Promotion Project. And has since we have the collection building of the, all the libraries in China. And so far, it has been the, the biggest projects in the collection and integration. And so far, it has 274 branches of local libraries and have 7.72 million pieces of information has been released. And uh, the, 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 mo the most frequently standard is from GRS from America and the DC government. And in China, it is uh, maintained by the government standard. And uh, this collection is still a blank sheet. And I'd like to introduce this government and also the standard index information. This government is based on the uh, in published in 2011 and it hasn't been updated yet. And they are based on the 15 core elements, elements and increase one term and the data and they are restriction. And this volume that's because it has integrated the advantages of the previous index, but one drawback is that it hasn't disclosure the speciality of the government affairs. It is a more general standard. And this uh, IPC is issued by uh, in 2007, and it has a six must chose elements and the and the 10 optional ones to have the the management and the content and also the indicators and also the principles and methods. And this advantage is that because it is very authentic in the government institutions, however, some standards are mostly about the description of the resources rather than the relations. And in the beginning of the project, NLC has carried out a pilot project on the information and then based on the requirements of the resources, and they have the special standards for the government resources information from scratch, changed gradually and improved. It has become the, the basic industry and the resource index guidelines are still under inform. During the process, we have uh, three principles one is based on the needs of the, our resource users. For example, we are more about the disclosure of the content rather than the uh, parameters. And also in order that we have a sharing, shareability, we have to maximize the generality of the core elements and follow the rules of the abstract principles. 
And also based on the generality, we have to take a full into consideration of the individuality, the difference between the national government and the local government libraries and uh, the different terms. And the terms are based on the government affairs index. And through this uh, information forms, we can see that besides the terms of the, our metadata, we have increased the date of a start and language and the other information to disclosure. And this kind of uh, organization is based on the types and the style and, and also the information resource. And about the resource classification is based on the, the city council on disclosure and the government information, we are choosing what the we have made it into a more general application for the other local government. And the style classification is based on the 15 public affairs styles in the institution. And about the type classification, because there are a lot of diversified and not a mature diversification in our platform. So we have a special part of it. And those are our references that we have followed or we have cited. And besides that, under this uh, cultural projects, we together with uh, the NLC do start the archive web projects. Because in China, we haven't have a metadata resources and a standard in the, based on the metadata. Therefore, we used the DCA and also the cultural industry standards about the metadata of the web as resources. A special form, that is our basis. And then we have set up the distribution of the metadata. And in this standard, we have uh, considered the specialty of the web. And we have used the vocabulary classification. And the open data, this is another way for to integrate the, the data that has been opened. We started it from the 2012. Beijing, Shanghai, Zhenjiang, these are the three platforms. And then based on the notice of the big data action of a plan and from the state council, general office of the state council on printing and distributing implementation plan for integrating sharing government information systems with the project has witnessed a very sharp increase. And by 2011, there are more than 300 that has been put online. And in 2019, it has uh, achieved more than one, more than 10,000. And though we have uh, this standard online, however, there are no national standards. So it cannot reflect this depth and also the effect, effect of this standard. And right now in the big data and the mega data, the vocabulary recorded the furthest. It's a very general, consistent with the standards of the European Euro, uh, Union and America. And this index in 2014, we have a better version. And in February this year, we published the second version. TCAT in the introduction of the interface, it has it has this uh, vocabulary form or glossary to have this interoperability. It has a seven. The first version has the seven uh, classification, and the second version has a thirteen. So in my PowerPoint, those are the second version; those are updated ones.
get used to the FOF and the RDF and all kinds of uh, index glossaries. It has uh, determined that they have this interoperability. And this is national strategic data resources. It is very critical for the people and the government. Therefore, in the future, I think the data board should commit it into this um, project to share in the, the metadata. In 2017, uh, together with the Wuhan University, we have a, a trying project on network information collection and preservation. And based on the resources that we have collected, and the CD as a software to build up and to realize the different formats process of the metadata. And we have uh, three aspects to have the, the, the description of the resource management of the resource. And from the subject institutions and the groups, the subject We have the 21 classification of the subject. And after half a year of construction, then we have a three groups, 82 institutions, 5,128 data sets. Now, previously, it is a pre brief introduction of uh, the projects and the practice of the integration of resource information. And after decades, years of um, trial, we have uh, got several achievements and the, some others are have a bright future, but we still have some problems to solve. Comprehensively speaking, the construction right now has a very prominent challenge is the openness and the depth of this information. For example, for the opening resources, if, yes, we have integrated them together, but there's still lack of the relations exploration. For example, we have to disclose the comment or the integration of the public publication and documents, and also this uh, online government information hasn't been integrated into the other publication and documents or haven't integrated with the, the non-governmental information like the derivatives or the library collections. And the third part is, like we have said that the Several ways to construct the information and integration, they are separated from each other that haven't been shared information or relations together. And these three types of information can unleash their potential only when they integrate together. And also, we haven't have a comprehensive uh, standard. We still have a aspect of the government institution I think this should be the major part and the major body of it. It is indiscoverable. And without it, it could, um, in fact, there's a smooth flow of the information sharing. So we have to make better use of this uh, megadata and to integrate the resources into a very comprehensive and scientific system. And in order to improve the openness and the depth of the government information integration, I think the library should, about the integration, we should do as follows, based on the, based on the, the system standard construction, we have to uh, research on the, the need of the, of the resource and also to set up the model and to have a more scientific framework and also to, to research on the tools. For example, about the standard data, about the classification integration forms and improve the openness. The library should actively cooperate with the government, participating in the standards and openness and service and the other jobs. 
And the second is that the government should to have at the set up the openness standard. The research could be on the GCAP standard, like the metadata web resources, and the metadata as the foundation to have a the, the open source system and standards that is more active, applicable in China for the China's status and also to set up the systematic platform building and then to provide the public more systematic data service. I think so much for this. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Ms. Sally. Now let's move to the second speaker. And the second speaker is Ms. Xia Tui Juan. And you can start sharing your screen. Thank you very much. Hey, Ms. Wang Di, dear moderator, can you hear me? Can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, we can hear you, not a problem. So let me start sharing my screen so everyone can see my screen clearly. Clearly, um, okay, so can you see my screen? Yeah, not a problem. So I'll start momentarily. Faculties, experts, good morning everyone. I will share some experience lessons and questions of modeling different metadata schemas to one ontology. So in other words, uh, I'm going to use the Shanghai Library as an example to talk about application profile as a method for modeling different metadata schemas as one ontology. So I like to share how we're able to integrate different modeling metadata schemas into one or integrated ontology. So these are my major content. First of all, I'm going to talk about our Digital Humanities Initiative of Shanghai Library. And after this, I'm going to talk about application profiles, what it is and what we mean by metadata application profiles uh, and ontology application profiles. And also I'm going to talk about how to design it and uh, Lastly, I'm going to talk about how we're able to change from multiple application profiles to a top design in interoperable ontology. And lastly, I wish to ignite a discussion with every one of you, which is how to reuse vocabulary and extend ontologies to other fields. First of all, some background introduction about digital humanities in Shanghai Library. So for our library, we started digital humanities back in the year 2014 and 2015. Until 2016, we released the first digital humanities platform of Shanghai Library. Um, this is a service platform for uh, genealogy. And then we uh, had digital humanities in relation to archives, manuscripts, uh, and memory of Shanghai, which is about ancient and old movies. So in the deal process, we've collected all the information as well as all the data. We've completed an API platform, and this is the website for the open data. And on the basis of the data, as well as on the basis uh, of API, we open all our data to the general public. And until now, we have organized five open data competition for the general public. And in the past, we uh, have had several methodologies. First, we give everything cool URI as global identifier and locator to link everything together. So for everything on the website, we have a unique identifier, which is an HTTP format. And uh, secondly, we transform all metadata records in different formats into RDF format. So for library related metadata, uh, this is enormous resources, but for all the metadata, whether it's about the description of archives, manuscripts, genealogy, or um, movies or ancient books, all the metadata um, is uh, referred to um, different articles or journals. But for us, we need to further and deeply integrate different contents. So when we convert 
all the metadata formats into RDF. So in the content of journal articles, as well as in the content uh, from other open data from the web, we um, enrich more semantic data for digital humanities by extracting structured data from digital scan images or web information. So we're able to offer um, much more semantic information to everyone who wishes to do humanities related research. We've done several semantic projects and we put them and separated them into um, individually independent boxes, but on the basis they are connected with each other. In other words, this is what we call um, um, different um, boxes. Um, in, um, they cover different knowledge in different areas, including historical architecture knowledge base, name authority database, China history uh, chronology database. So we offer different services based on different boxes. And also we do geographic uh, names, uh, events knowledge base, uh, as well as other basic knowledge bases. So these are some of the knowledge bases we've completed in the past several years. And on the bottom of it, we have a basis knowledge base. So the base knowledge base is to offer a linkage or uh, acts as a hub for different uh, other specific knowledge bases. So for example, in some specific knowledge bases, we have archives, movies, or ancient books combining together. So all the linkages are connected with each other. So in our name authority database, if you locate one person, so on the web page of this one person, you are able to find all the other information in the Shanghai library in relation to this person, um, regardless what the original format of the metadata is. So based on URI, everything can be linked together uh, through an API platform. However, we need to consider how we're able to integrate everything uh, by using a semantic method instead of just um, physically putting everything into a database. So from a semantic perspective, we integrate them together as we said before. We use the one ontology methodology. So you can see the graph from the right here. This is how we integrate data from different resources. This is a high level interoperability framework. So in the framework, uh, for all the recorded metadata, for all the linked metadata, they link together with each other. And previously, we talked about some of the um, practices in Shanghai Library, as well as how we link different things together um, in the field of metadata. And then um, I'm going to talk about how we're able to change from the original individual metadata schemas to one ontology application profiles. And we like to talk about the design process as well. So first of all, these collections with different metadata schemas have metadata records in different formats. So um, for our genealogy metadata, it's based on C and Mark plus localized. Localized, uh, I mean places, migration, and different ancestors. Um, they are in standard C and Mark um, format. Previously, did not exist, but we expanded them on the basis of C and Mark. So for archives, uh, it's based on DC plus extension. So it covers much more variant types, including uh, resources, letters, manuscripts, and physical objects of Shanghai Library. And also, we have integrated a lot of manuscripts from other um, ancient um, collections, for example, from some private collectors or from some other his, uh, history books. Because they um, are located um, from a chronological order of time, so their formats are totally different. So uh, previously, this was a difficult task for us to integrate them into one. So in our archives, uh, it's also on the basis of C and Mark. But as we said before, we uh, refer to lots of information from the general archives uh, from other libraries. So their formats could be different, but based on one ontology, we are able to um, integrate them into one. 
uh, if we simply depend on the metadata schema, we are unable to do it. And also for old movies, uh, because this is a multimedia format, um, and like audio, video, uh, as well as other resources, and for um, different uh, formats, they have different description of metadata. So by using the original metadata schema, this could be difficult to integrate. And also for uh, famous people, um, we started to integrate it. Uh, we started to integrate um, resources in relation to famous people starting from the year 2004. And in this particular pool, um, we also have different um, formats, including like letters, photos. Um, and uh, back in the year 2004, we use CM Mark as well as application profile to integrate all different metadata schema into one. So basically what we want to do is to use one ontology to integrate different uh, metadata schemas in different formats into one. And this is the metadata schemas of archives and manuscripts. Uh, it's on the basis of DC core and uh, extended refinements. This is a quite an enormous metadata um, project. Uh, it covers 100 different properties, 12 different resource types. So for these uh, metadata schemas, it uses DCAP at that time. So it has a very good foundation. So today I want to talk about how we're able to change from the metadata application profile into a one ontology application profile. I'm going to use one specific example to talk about how we're able to design such an application profile. Now let's talk about ontology application profile. An, applica an ontology application profile was released by the Singapore Annual Conference. It needs to define classes and properties with RDFs or OWL. And uh, the ontology application profile later becomes an important application for uh, metadata. It's a framework for methodology as well. And this methodology um, later progressed on the basis of the semantic um, circle. For example, last year, during the TC my, um conference in show, we had a particular session discussing multi-field application profiles. But first of all, what's an application profile? A profile is any document or file that describes the structure or content of a set of data. And application profiles are designed to be used by some definable set of applications, and they should be machine actionable. Uh, here, I wish to stress machine actionable. In other words, they must be coded uh, after the application profile is coded, it would be um, machine actionable. If it's not machine actionable, it cannot be shared. For metadata application profiles, it defines metadata elements and refinements with XMLS or RDL schemas. And here we have a graph here. This shows how we change a metadata schema into an application profile, as well as some of the regulations. To define a metadata element, we can use the following different properties, including labels, um, comments, mandatory uh, information, repeatable information, data type, or scheme itself. So by using these properties, we can use uh, XML or RDF schemas. Uh, in other words, the machine actionable languages to decode um, the metadata. So eventually it can be read by the machine and then it can be read by the system. So it can be transmitted in the system or it can be exchanged in um, the system. So this graph uh, is to design um, the metadata schemas. For example, in terms of uh, manuscripts, 
um, if I try to uh, duplicate DC terms, it tells you how we're able to define the property. So this is um, the same as what I just said. So if we just take manuscript as an example, this shows how the application profile is applied. So for the same element, a different application profile, uh, it's mandatory, it's repeatable, or it's data type could be adjusted based on the needs of application. So once you have the good definition uh, based on a particular action, um, a machine readable scheme, um, you can just do interoperability. So ontology application profile um, is a kind of application profile on the basis of metadata application profile. So previously in some other conferences, I talked about the relationship between metadata application profiles and ontology application profiles. If you are interested, we can have further discussion later on. Given that time is limited, I'm not going to talk about this. But here I wish to touch upon ontology application profiles as well as uh, its particular features. Ontology application profiles define classes and properties with RDFs or OWL. So, in ontology application profiles, it has several definitions of classes. First of all, you need to define parent class, its label and comments. And also, um, in terms of the definition of properties in ontology application profiles, we can use the following properties for definition, including parent property, domain, uh, range, label, comments, mandatory, repeatable, used with or expected value constraints for the um, black font. That means if I wish to duplicate the current existing property, I just need to adjust some of the original um, definition and just copy and paste, and that will be okay. But for other existing vocabulary, once it's defined in the previous system, uh, it could not be used in some other application scenarios. So we're able to use the following four red um, keywords to further uh, define and limit. Uh, so let me just give you one example here. So in the um, manuscript related ontology application profile, uh, I'm here showing you how to define different properties. So for properties, we can use different labels. And for the properties, first of all, This is about BitFrame um, feature, it's called um, held back. It's about a single property holder. So here, first of all, I cite the definition from the BitFrame vocabulary, including its domain and range definition, because they refer to the original definition in BitFrame. But for the manuscript ontology application profile, because this application scenario is different, so we need to have a further definition. For example, in the property held back, in BitFrame, its range uh, is agent. So in the agent, it includes um, groups, individuals, uh, web agents, as well as others. But for our archive ontology application, and profile, I can just do another regulation because uh, all the collectors are from Shanghai Library. So Shanghai Library is an organization. So in this application profile, so for its expected range, I can do a, a further refined definition. I can define it as an organization instead of individuals. So when there is a change in the range definition, you need to be aware that the organization must be a subclass of the agent. So if you do this, there will be no there will be no conflict in relation to the original definition. That's how we do uh, definition in uh, application profile, as well as how to do some changes uh, according to the original application profile. So the general golden rule here is to narrow down uh, the scope of range. But you need to make sure uh, the narrowed down scope of range must be a subclass of the original range. Otherwise, there could be some conflicts. So after you do the definition, uh, we can use uh, just a schema uh, as a kind of format to fix the definition. So this definition 
will become the ontology application profile for manuscripts. So for all the other properties, once you finish all the definition, you will create a whole application profile. So once you have the ontology application profile of manuscripts, uh, it has already been coded, it has already become a system. So this application profile can be submitted online. So based on another system, uh, we can uh, make it readable by human beings. So after we have the encoded application profile, it can be acquired on the web. So it becomes very accessible to the whole general public. So for all our researchers, uh, they can refer all the information from the ontology application profile. So in other words, the final goal is for sharing. And also we can do digital uh, authentication uh, and discovery as well. For example, let's say if I change the range from an organization to a non-organization, so the action becomes invalid. So this is how we um, do some limitations in relation to the particular range. So this is one of the great beauties of ontology um, application profile. And also at the same time, we have done ontology application profile in relation to archives and manuscripts, as well as um, geology, as well as um, what we call the old memories of Shanghai. So after we have all these ontology application profiles, for different application profiles, they may have different restrictions and limitations in relation to the same properties. But how can we integrate them together uh, under the brand of digital humanities? Here, we need the ontology methodology. So let's take a look at uh, how we do the ontology application profile in relation to uh, genealogy, um, archives, as well as others, and what kind of vocabulary we have already used. So you can see there has been lots of vocabulary commonly used. So in fact, uh, when we uh, design all the application profiles, um, we did not actually do all the application profiles at one go. We did one after another. So because it followed a sequence, later on when we designed other application profiles, you need to be aware that there is no conflict between the previous application profile and the upcoming application profile. How to avoid conflict? This is what I said before. This was shown in the graph. You can just use the black fonts uh, using all these um, properties to define your application profile. So you can do further limitation and restriction. So if you do this, you are able to avoid conflict in the abstract model and you can also uh, gain better integration in the abstract model. So in this abstract model, um, for all the commonly used catalog, we create a high level interoperability frame. So for this frame, we can um, integrate all different application profiles into one ontology application profile. And this is what I said before, one ontology to cover all application profiles, including all classes. So for all these pink ones, these are commonly used um, application profiles, including um, persons, uh, SHL, person or organization, uh, temple. So for uh, other different colors, these are self-refinement um, categories. So for self-refinement categories, um, together with the high level interoperability frame, they do have a kind of like a top up um, relationship. So under the big umbrella, they're able to integrate and combine everything together. And lastly, I wish to talk about how to reuse vocabulary and extend ontologies. Let me just give you one particular example here. Uh, this is the data model of SHL person, and these are some of the actual um, situations. So for SHL person, this describes people, including um, information in relation to the person, including feature, organization, different nicknames or celebrity names of the individual person, and also the relationship in relation to the person. And here we duplicated 
uh, lots of other vocabulary in other database, including FOF. Uh, FOF, uh, we here, we defined um, person catalog in Shanghai Library, but we used the, all the same uh, properties from FOF. And also we have some other self-designed, uh, self-refined properties. For example, for uh, some um, Chinese poets, they do have their own uh, special like middle names. So we created our own particular application profiles for uh, ontology extension for these Chinese poets. And also we use GN names as well. So GN names um, are used to refer to uh, some particular location information in relation to the individual person, including, for example, where uh, this person was born. And also we uh, used ORG uh, from WORC. Um, this is also a kind of a catalog used by the international organizations. And also we self-defined um, uh, organization in Shanghai Library. And also there is another one called Relationship Ontology Properties. And uh, we used the same properties uh, in relation to describing different relationship between different person to persons. And this is an example of um, the person data model to integrate the data of CBDB. So for the name authority a database ontology, um, this is uh, how we built. So what we do the archive project, we extract all the uh, names of those peoples uh, themselves as well as their ancestors and then we put them everything in the name authority database and then when we do the archives project we record all the other metadata into the person data model or in other words the name authority database and then we have the uh, geology uh, project and then we have some other building uh, project as well and then we extract all the metadata and put them into the name authority database so the most important uh, information is highly relevant to Shanghai Library, which is the information in relation to um, the bias of, of the person. So that's how we link everything together. So when we do our digital humanities, instead of, of just focusing on basic information of the person, including date of birth, as well as where this person was born, as well as other nicknames of the person, uh, we also need to um, record some significant events of the person as well as the relationship, the social relationship between the person as well as other people around him, as well as, for example, the promotion or the career development of the individual person in different dynasties. So in this context, we also do another project. Uh, it's called uh, CBDB and uh, we integrate the data of CBDB into our person data model. We do two major extensions. One is an extent of the relationship between one person to another and an so for this particular um, extension we um, enrich the description of the relationship between one individual person with another. For example, if we take the poet of Sushi as an example, it has 700 relationships with other people around him. And then we put everything into the name authority and also we integrate all the information in relation to the career development of Sushi into this particular name authority database. That's how we extend enrich the whole uh, vocabulary and system. And lastly, I wish to talk about how to reuse the existing vocabulary. This is very detailed. This is very specific. Given that time is limited, I'm unable to give you very clear explanations, but you can just have a, a quick look. If you are interested, uh, we can uh, have further discussions during the questions and answers session, or we can have a further discussions after the meeting. So this is about how to reuse the existing vocabulary. So from metadata application profile to ontology application profile, the reuse of the existing vocabulary is very important. And here I have summarized some of my um, experiences from reusing existing vocabulary, but there could be some problems and uh, issues. Uh, I didn't actually list some of the problems or issues here because some of the things um, 
were not really confirmed by me, but later on we can have some other further discussions during other events or occasions. Um, I believe we can have some further discussion after the meeting. Yet yeah, these are some of my um, comments and uh, these are some of the things I wish to say. Lastly, I wish to share with you a whole situation of our Digital Humanities project. So I don't know whether you can see my screen here. Uh, if you are unable to see my screen, you can inform me in the chat box. So this is the overall Digital Humanities project of Shanghai Library. So these are some of the application profiles uh, established by us. So for the ontology vocabulary, uh, you can um, access from the website. And also, if you are a developer, or if you are, a, um, excuse me, if you are a researcher, you can just access all the different pools to uh, access or use uh, the informational resources here, or uh, through some digital humanities tools, you can just do some uh, changes. If you are a developer, you can just um, use our uh, open data API to um, do some coding by yourself. And also we have some research materials, including our uh, PPT, as well as our research articles. Everything can be accessed from the website. And here, also, I'm telling you, we are doing some projects. Uh, these projects are in progress at the moment. Um, from 2020, we are integrate all the previous digital humanities projects into our big data platform. It's a big data um, project. By using the same web page, we wish to offer services to our readers and also researchers. So on our big data platform, we have been doing a short, medium and long term plan for this. Um, the time um, point um, is that in October this year, we are going to organize an annual conference of Shanghai Library. So on the conference, we are going to update you with some of the progresses in relation to this big data project. I hope you will be interested. And during this uh, meeting, we will update you with some new resources, new tools, new technologies, and new methodologies um, with every one of you. Like, you know, something um, we were unable to do in the past because of lack of technologies, but now we're able to do it. So we will update you later on. Thank you very much. Now, I'll give it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Ms. Sha. So lastly, we wish to have some questions and answers session. So for all the uh... so please pay more attention to the time because we can limit it into the 15 minutes. All right. Okay, let's uh, invite the third speaker, Mr. Wang. Could you share your screen? Yes. Can you all see my sharing screen? Okay. Yes, we can see you and okay, we can hear you. Okay, good morning. Very happy to meet you in this forum and also thank your work of the organizers. My topic today is application of metadata standards in science and technology resource management. And we know that it has a very feature of the big and the big body and also the diversified resources. It is a very challenging topic. So this is a very useful tool to research the application of science and technology of metadata. And I will include those following parts. The first one is the, the features of the science and technology resources, and also some management status. And then to lead to the solutions for those challenges and problems, this megadata solution. And the third one is standardized situations in all aspects and all sectors. And also this uh, the systems and also the important standards of design technology resource metadata and also the practice and application. These are the six path. First is about the resource and technology resources. So we can have two aspects of a definition. The 
broader sense is the all resources that can directly or indirectly provide value for scientific research and technical innovation activities after development. And in a narrow sense, those are the human, material, financial, information, and other elements. And based on different classification, we would have a different principles. For example, if based on the status, we could have the physical and information. For information, we could have the, the tools and the materials. For the scopes, we could have the general or speciality. And the forms, we could have the for free or for cost or pr profitable. And from the elements aspects, we could have the finance, human, materials, and information. And right now, the mostly is based on the elements classification. And through the, the materials or the physical or the information resources are the major points of our research. So in, the, in my report, the resources are based on the equipment, the science and technology, natural resources, like the bases, and the tools and the machines, and the specimen, the materials, and also the uh, documents. And also we have the documents, the information, like the reports, the thesis, and the literatures. They are all from the literature aspect and from the tools on the machine and the measurement and the observation are all from the documents aspect. And then through those classification, we can see those uh, features. The features, they are a very specified resources. And sometimes they have the different research methods. So they have the different forms, they have the different formats and the different semantics. And also it has a very huge increase and a diversified sources. And we have input a lot of materials and resources into this research. So they have a huge number of the explosive amounts. And also they have the high value because it is a very added value. It can make contribution to the humanity. And during this uh, conversion, it can add value. And also it have a long-term stable and uh, the dynamic information. For example, like the material, the, the weathers and also the oceanic, it should have a updated very dynamically and we could have a updated requirements. And with the increase of the input, we have witnessed a huge development, but also we have seen some challenges. For example, the resource system is initially established, but the quantity and quality needs to be further improved. And the macro management and overall coordination have continued to advance. But the problems of decentralized resources and virtualized supervision haven't been fundamentally changed. And the third one is the degree of integration and the sharing has achieved important results, but the phenomenon of repeated waste of resources still exists. And also we have another problem. The breakthrough has been made in the standardization of resources management and the resource sharing. For example, we have set up the several organizations committees and also the, the standards of the metadata, like the sources, service, eco, ecology, and the machine, and all mechanics, but still the systematic has been informed very integratedly. The metadata is the data about data, and it needs to discover the location of the resources. So it is hugely based on the management, for example, the location, so that we can identify the place where it is and can solve the problem of the location. And the second is, since it can provide a very comprehensive information set about the description and to have a multi-channel multi source and exploration and a change or collection, and then it can have a foundation for the collection and also the withdrawal and make use of the information. And then it can 
help the users from the different channels, different departments to integrate and share. And also about the distribution of the assets of the management, it can give some tools to manage. It can improve the whole efficiency of the management of the resources. And the current status of a metadata standardization for science and technology resource management, those are frequently seen as standards. Like DC, DC is the most important standard, the multinational and the multi-geographical. And also it can have a, but, but it is not strong in the application of the speciality. And different from DC, FGDC, also have a very specific data standards and also the ISOTC 211 about the geography and the Darwin core about the biology and EML about the ecology and the CF about the weather DDI and those are very specific in a certain area and also they have a very special professional terms. And right now we have uh, set up the metadata standards based on the science and technology platform, like the, uh, the homeland resource information. And there are altogether 15 very typical standards. And next, I will focus on the science and technology resource metadata standard system and important standards that has been set up by our committee about the system and also the standard. And this is the organization, the committee, National Technical Committee 486 on science and technology. So based in 2009, we have set up this NTC 486. And this organization engaged in the national standardization within the field of science and technology platform and its related science and technology condition and sources for the centralized work of a standardization in its own field. This is the used modern uh, modern information technology and other means to effectively integrate science and research facilities and also instruments. For example, the principles and the methods, how can we manage and organize the megadata? How can we extract more megadata and the registered and the management? Those are very fundamental standards. And about the content, Content is about the resource, service, user, and management data, megadata. And the third one is about the, the formats and the process, and also the index. How can we explore and to search for the index? And those has encompassed the whole circle process and to form the system and the standards of the megadata. This is um, the public affairs and all have reflected on the forms. The most important one is the core metadata and I would go to in there in the further. And this is science and technology infrastructure. Those are the basis for for the main contents. And this is the cover and the contents. The metadata framework, one is the core, one is general, and one is the special. The core is the OD foundation, and this is the smallest unit. And the general data is like the science and technology literature and the documents. And the special is a more specific, is about more specific resources. For example, the weather information, the health of the population, the general megadata, including the core megadata, but it shouldn't be conflicted with the core data. 
and also new megadata should, should be inconsistent with the matter extension principle. And I will not go in detail due to the time limit. This is the megadata standardization process. And this distribution is the very basic, uh, the smallest unit. Uh, this is the cover and the content. It's including seven and also the two the basis. For example, the indicators, the name, identifiers, the latest submission date and what kind of description, the related the keywords, the access restriction. It is the access restriction or the safety based restriction and also link address of resource the two entities, including submit it is the end resource category. Uh, this standard is tailoring of a doubling core metadata. At the beginning, we had the design with uh, 19 metadata elements and the four entities. However, due to the complexity of the practical application, especially the wider variety and different types of resources, it is impossible to describe them with unified metadata. Therefore, the drafters cut out the metadata content and formed the current 7 plus 2 mode. And also due to the big data and the internet and the cloud computing, the current resource core metadata can no longer meet the demand. And so that the standards are being revised, adding metadata elements or entities such as source ownership and the multidimensional classification. And that during the implementation that we have found that most are implemented in the form of the core metadata of a service and integration. So based on this, we have also developed the service. It has identified the description and the content, the extension principles and the consistency requirements, and also have described the seven Data and the two entities like the the service name, keywords, release date, content description, restriction of visit, and also the registration and management. We can control its uh, classific uh, control this metadata and to achieve the efficient management only when we have this registration. So those are the register, the submitters, they are responsibilities and the collection, the approval and the publishing and all kinds of process. The input and output of all the process, this is the process, the different world, uh, different roles of the different parties. And then we need to submit step by step to submit the MAC data and to increase, uh, to realize the different sharing and exchanges of the metadata, we need to have a exposure model uh, to have the report format. This is the, the standardized format using the SML, XML about the structure and the principles, SM gamma principle and the schema design principle, and to have a very specific report schema. Ah, this is the structure, the main content. We can have the, the beginning, the body, and the end, and also the several elements. How can they reflect into the, uh, the XML schema? Uh, this is a very specific reform structure, uh, form structure. And the application practice. First, it is uh, applied to the Certified platform, those are the 20 centers, like the weather and the ecology and the materials. And another one is the, the plant or the, uh, the mineral, the species, the specimen database. And also it can, we have the sharing network. It is a very important application scene, now we have more than, six, more than 600 of the sharing and the research uh, functions onto our network. 
And in order to have a highly high quality and high efficiency application, we have also have the uh, registration management system developed. For example, how can we log in? Uh, the standard approval, voting, management of users, the different function. And this is the notice interface. Registration, the change, the revision, the quality certification, and the voting for the metadata, and the results of the vote, and the dynamic management, all kinds of uh, management. And in order to manage the metadata, we also have a consistency test system of uh, scientific and technological resource metadata so that we can provide the national science and technology infrastructure platform. This is the process, the roadmap, the different statistics, and how can we present it? And the design the map of the whole system and also the approval process of the experts. And based on the, in the metadata standards, and using this as a tool, we have um, uh, followed and to manage. And since 2009, we will carry out once every year at least, and to have the spot test of the quality. By 2019, we have uh, got a huge amount, more than six million of uh, pieces of metadata, like the more than 1.7 thousand of uh, equipment and the wind tunnel, more than 800 of the measurements of the wind tunnel, and also 1.2 million of uh, our plant resources. And we have more than eight of the, the wild station and 11 national equipment center, 14 national analysis center, and the literature from all kinds of uh, all walks of corners of the country. And also we have integrated the 90 a special database and a non-special resource database. Uh, those are the relevant English version. And just to summarize from the feature of the resources of the science and technology, the status, the problems and challenges, and to provide the tools and also the, the solutions and the standard and the application in the practice. So we can see that this is a very important tool in the integration and the opening and the sharing of the resources can play a much better role. All right, thank you for your listening. These are my parts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Mr. Wang. And we'll give the floor to Ms. Huang. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Ms. Huang, you can start sharing your presentation slides as well. Dear colleagues, experts, faculty, students, good morning. Our previous presenters did wonderful presentations. Uh, I've learned a lot. They talked about how metadata um, is used in government, in science and technology, in education, how metadata is organized in multiple fields. And for me, I'm going to talk about using metadata in organizing educational resources in China. It's 10.30 already, in, however, all the presenters did a wonderful job. So I'm not going to talk about uh, as what I expected to say. I wish to leave more time for questions and answers uh, in the end. So my presentation will be divided into two parts. First, I'm going to talk about the development of standards. Second, I'm going to talk about the application of standards. The development of standards uh, cover some technical details. I'm not going to elaborate on this. So in the past 10 years, um, China uh, has been committing to establishing metadata standards in education in 
2012, we had a particular document saying that we should accelerate the speed of establishing metadata standard in education, not only in schools, in education, education providers, but also in the industry. So that means uh, in the system, we not only have one standard, we should have multiple standards. We should not only have the national standards, but also the industry related standards. And also, uh, based on the industry standards, we should build a better environment, um, both from a hardware and also a software perspective. And during the 13th five year plan, it mentions again the accelerated establishment of industry related standards to make sure eventually we come up with a multiple mechanisms for the development of the educational sector. Why did we mention multiple mechanisms at that time? In fact, uh, after moving into the 21st century, China has been focusing on establishing uh, high quality classes and lessons and different curricular um, programs. And we've made a lot of progress in the past several decades. And now we have hundreds of thousands of um, high quality curricular um, classes. However, in order to better share the resources, we must have good industry standards to make sure the opening, the sharing can be achieved. Uh, back in the year 2017, we implemented another three industry standards by the Ministry of Education of People's Republic of China, including the basic education teaching and learning resource metadata information model, the basic information teaching and learning resource metadata XML binding, and also the basic education teaching and learning resource metadata implementation guide. You can access all uh, the industry standards from the Ministry of Education official website. As Ms. Wang said before, um, the industry standards are in PDF versions. So in the first standard, it has 24 pages. So everything is pretty clear. So I'm not going to elaborate on this. So apart from the Ministry of Education, um, we also have some other industry standards from other government departments. For example, uh, in China, we have the metadata of primary and secondary schools digital textbooks released in 2017 by the State Administration of Press Publication, Radio, Film and Television. And uh, um, these industry standard aims at coordinating the digital textbooks as well as the printed textbooks um, for primary and secondary school students and make sure they are the same and they are aligned with each other. And also during for our national standards, we have three national standards, we have the names here. Maybe you may feel strange. Why do we have the national standards set by the General Administration of Quality Supervision and also the Inspection of Quarantine of the People's Republic of China? In fact, these two institutions um, govern the quality of different industry standards. And also in China, because we have multiple ethnic groups. So for minority ethnic groups, sometimes they have their own uh, languages. So for example, um, the administration of quality and technical supervision of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in 2017 released the My Bilingual Education Resource Library Part 3 resource metadata, both in Chinese and also in its own language. So as we said before, from all the um, implementing institutions, they are mainly from the Ministry of Education, Administration, uh, Supervision, Quality, and also some uh, provincial um, departments. We believe we still have more space to set up more standards. And you can see for uh, nearly all the standards were set back in the year 2017, and they were drafted back in the year 2013. We believe they need to be updated and they need to be much more detailed. And also at the moment, there is no particular guideline in relation to the implementation of metadata. The implementation of metadata is very important. So we believe there is still room for improvement. Uh, as we mentioned um, before, we have the basic education teaching and learning resource metadata, but at the moment we don't have any industry standards in relation to the implementation of metadata. 
And also, as we said before, uh, we have the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region releasing its own education resource. However, we have other minority ethnic groups as well. Perhaps they need to release their own bilingual education resource as well, and further research needs to be done in this area. And for our national standards, I also um, refer them to the Duplin Core Element Set. So you can see the Duplin Core Element Set here, and uh, you can see detailed information here. So on the left, we have the 15 core elements here. On the right, we have the core set element layered in graph for primary and uh, um, secondary uh, schooling, more specifically. And then I made some comparison here. However, there, um, for example, for meta meta data, this is covered in um, the Chinese system. However, there is no meta meta data in the Dublin Core uh, element set. And in China, usually teachers and students access usually the subjects uh, first to access more information like Chinese mathematics or, or English. Um, so they do not completely coordinate um, and correspond to Dublin Core Element Set. But if we refer to another graph here, uh, this can be much clearer. So here, uh, if you see this part here, uh, rights and relation, uh, these are covered in a Dublin Core Element Set. However, there is another one called Annotation. So annotation is unique in the Chinese context. It's good for education service providers to assess the quality of teaching at, at the moment. It, this is pretty important because uh, we are seeing a growth in online courses. For some of the uh, online courses, they are not listed as national courses, but they are still pretty good courses. And also in the metadata development process, I also compared metadata element description methods in China as well as DCMI, as well as some other uh, metadata related terms. We only have these two totally the same as each other. And for the others, uh, some of them uh, have quite significant gaps, some of them are just similar. Well, in fact, for some of our participants, uh, they are not really experts um, in uh, DCMI, so I'm not going to elaborate uh, on this. I'm going to uh, draft a research uh, in this regard. We have already got um, the sketch already. And also, the international standards in relation to DCMI is moving from strength to strength. So for us in China, especially in the educational sector, we should also refer to some of the updates in international standards to make some corresponding adjustments. So these are uh, some of the latest initiatives from DCMI from 2017 and 2019. So for this one, it uh, uh, changed some of the um, properties uh, and also it uh, has some other changes. There are lots of details information here, so I'm just giving you some cues. And also in DCMI itself, it has lots of new changes as well. So on the official website, it um, talks about what the changes are. And also on the right, we have all the um, Chinese here. So this is the first part. Now let's move to the second part of my presentation. The second part is about application of metadata standards in educational information resources in China. So there is a feasible way. Um, to see how the standards are applied. So first of all, we need to refer back to those sharing platforms in education. So this is the official website from the Ministry of Education. We have MOOCs as well as other open sharing online courses. So first of all, I search um, its um, main um, website. We have disciplines. We have purpose, we have popularity, novelty, recognition, what courses offered by which university, a course status, as well as other aspects. These 
information aims to allow users to access the required information from different catalogs. For example, let's say I'm a student who wants to learn English. Uh, and I want to say two of our lovely interpreters here have done a fantastic job. So let's say now I want to learn English. I'm an ordinary student. And let's say, for example, I wish to access some information about one particular university, for example, Wuhan University. So I can access all the information here. It has all the sub information in the particular catalog. For example, in uh, discipline, in um, novelty, popularity, it has more information here. And also in popularity, you can see um, how many students uh, gave likes to your particular um, course. So, for example, if I'm a teacher, if I want to see whether I'm welcomed by my students, I can access all the information here. So, uh, all the rankings are um, based on the length of time a student is online. This is very important for assessing the quality, the overall quality of the, the course to see whether the course can be awarded five star. So now I want to particularly focus on some um, subjects. Let's see what elements are used to describe that particular subject. Uh, and my course is about information search. So this is our logo. And uh, uh, it's in the discipline of information management. And also we have a video, a promotion of video here, and we can see the number of participants. Sometimes from the number of participants, we're able to, to a certain extent, assess the quality of the subject. But there is another criteria, um, which is uh, the level of completion of uh, participants attending the subject. Sometimes some uh, students attended the class, but eventually they became dropouts. And these are some of the standards used by the Ministry of Education for the overall assessment of the course back in the year 2017. And here uh, we can see uh, we opened the course uh, from 2014. It's a biannual course. Now this is the 12th time we just completed um, the course. We um, have a course from uh, February to June. So at the moment, um, it's not opened yet because we are going to open a course very soon and we're able to see the number of participants. We're able to see the overall quality. We have 2,600 reviews and we can see whether our course is five star. But once again, thank you so much to all our students. Uh, they have already given a five star review. Uh, I always uh, access all these reviews. Uh, as well as some of the feedback from students to, to talk about how we're able to make uh, progress in relation to our subject. Because sometimes they give us feedback uh, about the subject, about our college, and also about our teachers. And also this is an introduction, a, a syllabus, uh, a curriculum syllabus. So for MOOCs, we believe uh, these two pieces of information are extremely important. Uh, one thing, they need to know what this subject is all about. And also for some of the subjects, they need some prerequisite knowledge. And here we say um, we require, for example, some prerequisite knowledge. And also this is the certification accreditation requirement. So if you complete uh, the subject, you will uh, receive a particular certificate, blah, 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 things like that. So uh, this is how we attract more students as well. And these are some of the references. So for different subjects, we can see we have multiple elements to describe the subjects and we can do a compare and contrast between all the subject information with the DCMI uh, core elements. For example, for the teachers here, if we go back to DCMI, that means contributors. And also we have, for example, like assisted teachers, we can be other contributors. And also like um, our, our subject evaluation, uh, this is equivalent to uh, what we describe in DCMI as description. And now, um, online education is moving from strength to strength, and especially we're in the midst of COVID-19. So uh, at the moment, we have a road map um, in relation to the development of open education. A uh, follows three stages. So in 2020, we established an alliance. In May 
to June, uh, we will establish a steering committee. So for China, we respond very quickly. Uh, this is an initiative from UNESCO, and in fact, in um, in fact, excuse me, this is the MOOCs Action Descla Declaration in um, China, released by China in April last year. And uh, sharing is the foundation of China's MOOCs Sustainable Development. So to achieve um, sustainable development, we believe metadata as well as implementation of metadata is extremely important because the development of metadata serves the need of the strategic development of China. And please let me go back to what I said before. In fact, we were a bit ahead of um, the, the international trend. Previously, we said we wish to build an English version um, of our university MOOCs. Uh, and uh, this idea was re-proposed last year as well. In fact, during the first half of this year, we had 7.7 um, .7 million um, enrollments for different uh, online courses. In order to make sure all of the subjects can be widely shared and open, we do need a further develop development of metadata. And also, uh, in the international society, there are three important uh, organizations governing um, metadata. Um, the best work is from MEMEX. Um, this is from the MEMEX official website. This is uh, the elements covered in uh, edX official website. So this is um, an international website, so it has different access in English. And let's take a look at um, an individual one subject. This is the official web page for that particular subject. Um, in terms of number of participants, we are much better, but they these subjects cover more important information we do not cover. For example, um, students want to know what they can do in terms of career development after completing this particular subject, or what actual benefits the students can gain after completing the subject. And also, like, acquired skills for completing the uh, subject. We believe these are some of the things we can add back into our own online courses. But also, we do have something in similar, like level of difficulty or other elements as well. Given that time is limited, I'm going to stop here. And lastly, I wish to advocate one thing. At the moment, we see a further growth in open education. So all this high quality education resources needs to be shared and open. So we believe metadata development is very important and to make sure we have a coordinated and standardized metadata standard is very important. Thank you very much. Now I will pass the ball back to the moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for your speech, Ms. Wang. All right, let me moderate my sharing screen. Okay, our last but not the least speaker, Ms. Anne, you can share your screen. All right, thank you, Ms. Wang. Good morning, dear colleagues and teachers. Uh, it's very happy to attend this uh, symposium. I'm uh, An Lu from uh, Wuhan University. And uh, my topic today is the information organization in social media in public emergency situation. And uh, my speech would have uh, four parts. The framework of information organization in social media in public emergency situations extracting the values of metadata of social media, the associations of my information, and the based on metadata analysis. And the first about the We Are Social, the Digital 2020 reports. It shows that more than 4.5 billion people now use the internet, and while social media users have passed the 3.8 billion mark. 
And we know that social media is a very important source for people to obtain and release information in the context of public emergencies. Therefore, we would love to have a effective way to organize information with metadata and also to utilize the relevant metadata standards, natural language processing techniques, and appropriate resource association methods to improve this uh, structure and using like the macro block and to illustrate the revealed relations among the micro blockers and the posts. And we have this framework of distribution of metadata. It have a four parts. One is the sources, including publisher, authentication of the publisher, and the other contributors of this post, URL, and also the terminal of this post. And the, uh, the second one is content, including title, the abstract, keywords, time of the event, place, event type, behavior types, motivation, participants, result, and the related uh, URL. And the third one is about the information form. The time of the publication, whether it includes an image, video, related languages, and etc. And the fourth one is influence of information, like the count of likes, comments, retweets, forwards. And also we have to extract the values of a metadata. Previously, we searched the microblog platform for information about public images, and then summarized the list of URL links. And then the data collection tool like the Octopussy used to collect information about publishers, publisher authentication, publishing time, URL, content pictures and videos, source of posts, counts of retweets, counts of comments, and counts of likes. And this picture have showed you the process of collecting microblog posts about public emergency from the selecting extracted terms and collect URLs and collect all the posts. And how can we extract those metadata elements? Uh, we have uh, four ways. First is it directly match the collected data. For example, about the publisher URL, terminal release time, count of likes, count of comments, count of retreats, those elements. It can extract it directly. Or we use the extra uh, Excel function. For example, the authentication, the other contributors of the post, title, motivation, related URL, and whether it includes image or videos, we could uh, make use of the function of Excel. And the third one is the natural language processing programs for the abstract keywords, time, place, event type, behavior type, mm -hmm. participants, and results. We could use the natural language programs. And about the language, this element, we could use an artificial identification Microblock post correlation scheme. Based on the metadata, we would like to release those um, relevant association correlation. For example, the same publishers, what kind of microblock, what kind of blogs have he, have he or she published, and um, what is the, we have uh, two ways to have the associative aggregation. First, we extra, extra topics of uh, based on the natural language processing and the semantic mining techniques. And the second is to use the metadata or other features of micro blog posts. For example, computing similarity, numerical matching, feature classification, and so on. For the first element, the publishers authentication, uh, the other contributors, time, place, type, behavior type, time of publication, whether includes image and video. For those elements, we could use the match values, whether they are close, if they are very close, then we can have the relevant macro blocks to have aggregation. And uh, the second groups of elements, for example, the title abstracts, Participant results, we could use the semantic similarities, 
similarities to find the relevant microblocks. And also, we could analyze the social media based on the metadata. For example, if we want to check the topic influence and the sentiment of contention of event stakeholders. For example, we take the child abuse case in the Beijing red, yellow, blue kindergarten, for example. Uh, we use these three colors, red, yellow, blue, and child abuse as the search queries. The scope time is between November 22nd, 2017 to December 1st, 2017, including the original posts, forwarding posts, comments, retweets, link between users, authentication information tags, personal profiles. So we have selected more than 20,000 of uh, nodes. And this is the construction of a topic propagation maps and emotion propagation maps. In the middle is the core node. It is a very influential users. It has the A, B, C, D, E, the neighboring users reflect the retreats and the relationship between them. And some edges means the closeness. For example, it has the retreat a lot, then the line is a very thick. And also the different, uh, the colors would have the different stakeholders. And the, the node size means the emotional intensity of the users. And the tax is the topic that the user pays attention to. And the later we can use those topics to extract their intention. And if this is for the emotion prob propagation map, also we use those nodes and the different size and the labels. The node color is the user's emotion type. For example, happy, sad, rage, we will have different colors. The size of the node, meaning the informational uh, emotional intensity, is very happy. Very happy is to nine points, and then it is a very larger circle. And a little bit, a little bit happy, then it's a smaller circle. The node label reflects the type of stakeholder of the users. And then we have a four new index or or standards that to analyze the emotional propagation. One is the out degree of a topic. The out degree of a topic measures the percentage of the nodes that are connected to the core node and involve the same topics as the core node. It indicates the topical influence of the core node on the surrounding nodes. For example, at the A topic, if it is a very big influence, then the other neighboring users would also pay attention to a topic. And another one is the variation of a topic connected to the core node. And what is the percentage of the connection and involve different topics from the core node? If uh, they have a very high variation, then the users cannot influence the neighboring users' topics. The third index is the outgree of emotion. Is it to measures the percentage of the nodes connected with the core node and have the consistent emotion with the core node. So it means the surrounding nodes are affected by the emotion of the core nodes. For example, the core node is very sad. If it is have a higher influence, then the surrounding nodes will be affected by the emotion of sadness. Degree of emotional migration is the opposite of the outgree. It measures the percentage of the nodes that are connected to the core nodes but uh, emotionally consistent. So it implies the surrounding nodes would not be easily affected by the core node. And then this is the construction of the topic of propagation maps. We use the word to back and K means to extract the summary of the topic and high frequency words. And then we all together have 30 topics. I highlight the six and the 26. So that in the next slide, we could see these two topics are very prominent. Okay, this one is the 
propagation maps of event stakeholders from the beginning of the event to to the end initial period we could have broke breakage the extension period and also the ending period so we have uh, many six and the 26 those two numbers uh, that is the very important topics that have been paid attention to and different colors blue blue reflects the stakeholder stakeholders type the, those are the mainstream if the public it is the gray color six around the six there are very surrounding topics eight and still the initial period we have the emotion types and their colors in the middle m m means the mainstream media and op means the public the different colors reflects the different emotions like the blue for the sad the fear the fear is the purple and there which the light blue is very many so the mainstream emotion is the hatred that uh, derogatory suspicion and boredom and then it has the emotional evolution of the stakeholders in the life cycle the litigant litigant in initial period is a derogatory and even to nine points and the government in initial period is a six points of a derogatory and the mainstream mainly is a sadness 5.6 and the public is a nine points of a rage and this picture reflects the stakeholders in each period of the life cycle of the TO and EO. How much degree that they can influence others. The red circle is the is their maximum value of the different stakeholders. For example, in the initial the out the out edge is the biggest 0 0.667 it means that those surrounding users topics would be influenced by the litigant and this is quite consistent with our experiments because in the beginning we don't know what happened so their topics are quite consistent with the litigant and in the government during the eo achieved 0 0.585 means that so much degree of uh, uh, users would be influenced by the government and these two pictures is the analysis of the topic and informational influence of the core stakeholders for example the blue ones the youth league or the child protection organization it has the biggest has the biggest value so it can influence the surrounding ones and also the topic information propagation paths of uh, stakeholders. In the initial stage, the mainstream media to we media to the public, and while in the outbreak period, the mainstream to we media and then to the ordinary people, and also to the uh, public figures and to the ordinary people. And actually, if we organize this chain, we can found, find that most in the initial stage is the mainstream media or the government. And then to the end stage is the mostly ordinary people. All right, so these are my analysis of this chain and of this phenomenon. I'm quite inspired by the previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. An, a very wonderful speech. And also thank all our speakers in the morning about this uh, metadata case studies in China. And since uh, we have a very limited time, we can only select some of your questions to exchange with our experts. If uh, our audience have any questions would like to pose, and that you can tap, type it into our chat box. All right, we have someone. Yes. Yes, we have a question. Like in the academic circle, 
the publishers and the libraries, whether they have some conflicts in the construction and utilization of the metadata and how to integrate or how to do the balance. Uh, Ms. Xia or Ms. Wang. All right, Ms. Xia first. Okay. All right, let me converse uh, about mine observation. Actually, metadata standards. Okay, someone is not muted. Because I have uh, have many noisy feedback. All right, the standards of the metadata have a different standards making in the different scenes or different requirements. One way probably as one has said that we should have a registration system, unified registration system, and then the all areas can set up the standards of the metadata, the definition of the elements, and then people from the different areas, if they can use them, then, then they can do it. It is a very good way to have a unified registration system. And also we use the high level inter interoperability, use the ontology to maintain the uh, common sense of the common ground and can also maintain the speciality of the different areas and the publishing house as the upper stream of library i think our standards don't have uh, much conflict with publishing house and their uh, the data are also the reference for their libraries For example, those categories, we would refer to that of the publishing houses. And also we would add some of our own in accordance with our users' needs. Conflicts uh, is not so much. And about the coordination, there are many ways to do that through the technology or to using the system or the mechanism. All right, give the floor to Xia. Ms. Xia. Yes, I quite concur with uh, what Ms. Xia has said, but I have something to add. I think for the standards, I think a different application have a different differences because they have different needs or demands. For example, in the collection of the data, well, in this part about the metadata resources is uh, much more prominent than the collection stage. And as for libraries and publishing houses, since the category standards of libraries have witnessed a long time of history and has a set category and without a very fundamental conflict. And for example, those publishing houses, they have the, when they are doing the category, we are all referring to the National Library Index. for publishing houses and libraries. They have the different requirements for the, uh, the books because the publishing houses only have a very easy or a very strict or direct distribution of this book. And they have a more in timely requirements and the library is more focused on the content 
the evaluations set up and also give um, more detailed information for the users. Make the users using the metadata to judge whether I need this book or not. So they are not conflicted. They just have different functions. And also like the NFL, in the first they could have a, a index of the book and one is just for the reading only. And then the readers can, can see it very quickly. And then the next, the, and the rest would be analyzed by our staff, for example, the abstract or the standard, standardized management of the, of, the, of the information. And then it can meet the demands of different users. And how can we solve this confluence of a different metadata? Probably, I think in the end of the day, we still have to use the interoperability And a lot of uh, the metadata standards, I think, is not so much over diversified. And also, we are basically based on those uh, fundamental or general standards. Like we have uh, have a whole set of standards are all using this bay. Of course, we have to use the uh, later stage of processing. It is uh, in unavoidable. I don't think there's a much big problem. It can still maintain the generality and the individuality of the different metadata. Yes. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sai and Ms. Xiang. So. I, I saw there's a question to Mr. Wang Zhiqiang. Could you share with us during the 14th five-year plan about the big scientific projects like the big smart, big ocean, whether we could enlarge the construction of the metadata and what kinds of plan are there? All right, let me have a try. Actually, for the whether it's a scientific data or the database, there is a process. During the uh, before the 12 five year plan. Yes, there, there are some uh, the overlapping of the database. That's anyone uh, claims they are they are the national platform so since 13th five-year plan we gradually has some threshold management and regulations and also about the performance assessment identified a bunch of uh, organization institutions then altogether 23 organization and then enlarged to 28 and now it has um, increased to 51 platforms. Now the trend during the 14th five-year plan is still on the like your um, big health, big ocean, and the new type of infrastructure, data center, this kind of uh, area, we will have, um, we, we would increase the uh, those platforms, but this, they are they are of a higher quality and a more restrict assessment and evaluation. And also the allocation of capital and resources would be more strict. And about the information, uh, scientific data standard. Currently, we have a initial system, at least in the metadata, in the general metadata area. The metadata is more about national and the general data is more about the different sectors and industries. We already have the plans and the schemes, as I have said before. 
and maybe for much specific areas. Yeah, we could have the special metadata, which is not based on the national standards or in the form of a national standards, but more in the form of a sectors, group of standards. Yeah, and I think basically it's this. All right, thank you, Mr. Wang. Thank you for sharing. Oh, we have another question. I have a question for Ms. An Lu. Social media information organization, what's the difference between the acad academic information and what kind of extension probabilities are there? All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. And we all know that the academic literature is the structured information. The metadata is very mature right now, like Wang and the other speakers have showed. The metadata standards is very enriched and multi-levels, and also it's very clarified, like the title, the resources, and the keywords, and like the luck. And the DCA metadata have given us a good reference. And social media information belongs to the semi-structured or non-structured information. For example, the bloggers, the time, the terminal, these kinds of elements are very clarified. However, if we want to analyze the, the internal uh, nature, for example, the content, if we want to organize those elements, we have to use the modeling, the emotional analysis, and the naming, uh, naming entity identification. In this environment, the features and the attributes probably would be more complicated than the academic. Just now, I have seen some audience are asking what is the purpose of the social media information organization? Well, because they are very enriched and colorful, if we want to attract the value, of course, we could base it on the big data extraction. However, if the analysis of the index has to be organized by the emotion, and that is our basis of the experiment. And also the researchers maybe also needed to update their philosophy of the research. For example, the, the metadata, including a certain number of uh, metadata, and then to use the analyze. It's, it's like the supervised method that we set a plan, including which kinds of elements, and then to match the descriptive ones. But in, on the social media environment, if we c continue to analyze in depth, then we could find that there are some derivative and extensive that it is not unified. Because since it is, we have to have a plan, a detailed plan, a plan for the different applications. It should have a specific action plan. So I'm also thinking that whether we could make it into a supervised version and then to the non-supervised or the semi-supervised structure, you think first what kind of attributes and then to test whether it is consistent or related to your purpose and what's the degree of the relation and also, but right now we can we can realize your purpose, but we cannot explain the an attributes. So uh, from the aspect of the practical use, we needed to extract what kinds of elements for the organ, uh, for the construction of the social media information. For example, the people, time, place, and then further along, the retreat the retreat network. You could have the new index to measure and to find the answer that you are wanting. 
So this organization of social media, it should have a growth pattern based on your specific areas to have a more detailed extension. For example, as one said, it is about science and technology or about the government or about the education and about the culture. And then we find that different areas and to have a constant exploration. If we just extract those current and element sets, maybe it is not enough. But we could use this mindset to guide the construction of our social media information. Then that's why we emphasize the lineage because it has been a long time of development. It is quite mature. And in the network environment, uh, the task is much more challenging, but the information structure is a promises of the added value analysis. We hope more can committed into this and to help us to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Given that time is limited, we can move to the last question of today's webinar. We have another question here. The question goes to Professor Huang. National standards, regional standards, and industry standards, what are the relationship among the three? So some of our participants are very interested in the standards. So for our national standards, industry standards, and regional standards, or local standards, they don't show any different level in standards. All these standards differ in the scope of implementation. For national standards, they apply nationwide. It's a uniform standard applied to the whole country. So these national standards should be approved by, for example, the state council, as well as other competent authorities. For some industry standards, they only apply to one particular industry. So for industry standards, they don't mean that they could be made uh, randomly or out of nowhere. They should also be approved by the competent authorities uh, regulating the industry, but they should be registered uh, onto the competent authorities. If the industry standard becomes a national standard, uh, it becomes a national standard rather than an industry standard. For example, some of the recommendations given by the Ministry of Education in relation to any particular industry eventually become national standards. Locally, if there is, if there is no national standard or there is no industry standard, however, they do need to set up some quality assurance standard in relation to water treatment or some other treatments. We should make some local or regional standards. These standards should be made and approved by local authorities, and they should be approved by, for example, state council, as well as other competent authorities uh, of our country to um, come into effect. So for the setup of standards uh, should follow some procedures and regulations. Uh, this is the end uh, of um, my answer. And there is another question uh, I want to uh, answer. Uh, this question is about the system of metadata. It covers several aspects. First of all, what are the elements in the metadata? and how to describe the elements of metadata. So what are the requirements in relation to the description of the metadata elements? For example, dates, authors, uh, titles, they should follow some ISO standards. So there are some standards in relation to description and also management has some um, standards. Ms. Wang said uh, and mentioned about all these uh, standards before. So for today's topic, especially we need to talk about the metadata standard in relation to cloud um, data. At least you should have like a um, contribution element and you should have um, the element of creators. Um, this is also um, in line with the DCMI uh, standard and also some other standards or uh, elements in relation to contributors. If you have multiple creators, 
some of the uh, elements could be repeated. And for example, the types of the works, uh, the topics of the works and your user types as well. For example, some of the internet uh, novels uh, should not be uh, suitable for um, reading of um, adolescents. For example, you should set up some limitations. We know for internet-based um, works, uh, they are related to some other uh, works as well, so they have relation um, relationship. So by doing this, we're able to recommend good works to our uh, users. In fact, uh, in the age of era, everyone becomes a creator, everyone becomes an internet writer. However, reliability could be an issue if we have a review, if we have an assessment. When I see the question, I also did some internet search. For example, in China, we have some recommendation um, of internet-based novels. For example, some of the uh, internet novels uh, were recommended by, for example, Xinhua.com, as well as other credible uh, internet agencies. And also Soho.com uh, recommended some uh, internet-based uh, works um, on the basis of the influence created by the internet-based works. So perhaps we can add an element of review for all the works recommended or endorsed by Xinhua.com or by Soho or by some other um, rating agencies, uh, we, we believe this will be much better. So this is my answer to the question. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wang Di. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, this is the end of our today's webinar. And uh, for all our participants who are interested in the development of metadata, we can have further discussion with all our experts. And last but not least, let's give the floor to Professor Ruhua Huang to make a summary. Thank you. So I'm so delighted. Uh, well, this um, event is really beyond my expectation. Previously, I thought for metadata, such a technical discussion will not attract uh, a large number of participants. And at its peak, we attracted more than 260 people attending. And from the video, you saw me uh, staring at my mobile phone. And some of the international experts messaged me as well. They said, you've done an excellent job. So for our DCMI education committee, they spoke highly of us. And Ms. Lei from DCMI education committee is online but uh, she's overseas, so she's unable to attend our webinar. But unfortunately, um, she's unable to, to come. But thank you so much for uh, the guidance. And they spoke early of us, and they said our experts are true experts, and those questions are uh, very good questions. And uh, perhaps we can have a further report after this particular webinar. and. Uh, when we have more activities of DCMI uh, at later stages, we'll invite all our experts participating as well. Once again, thank you so much to your experts. Thank you so much to our organizing team. And also thank you so much to all our um, colleagues, participants, faculty, students at home and abroad. Thank you so much for um, spending wonderful time with every one of us. Thank you so much. And this is the end of my summary. Let me see why. Oh, last but not least, this event is part of our 100th anniversary of our school. And on the bottom right, we have Huanan University. Huanan Uni Wuhan University is regarded as the most beautiful university in China. We have our university here. We are by the East Lake. And uh, on the bottom right, this is the uh, logo of a 100th anniversary. In fact, we previously planned to have lots of offline um, events. And uh, JSDL um, was planned to be hosted offline, but because of COVID-19, lots of events have moved 
um, to online environments. So we do have lots of uh, subsequent events. So I hope you can participate in our events as well. And welcome to our school. I'm not a leader of our school, but as a faculty member, I hope we'll have more exchange in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Miss Wayne, that's it. Thank you very much. This is the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. See you. And this is also the end of today's simultaneous interpreting. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your hard work. And thank you so much to Lucius and Sylvia. Thank you so much. Well, in fact, um, I, I was planning to have you to turn up your microphone so they can see you too. Thank you very much.